of having them settle to become a, a, the dwellers in towns and villages to end their ancient wanderings. He also taught them to cook their food, which previously they had eaten raw. He taught them that it was not necessary merely to fish for their food with a bone hook. He taught them how to snare and capture animals. He taught them how to weave cloth. These are things that are particularly related to these cultured deities. To till the soil, to gather medicinal herbs, uh, to treat various kinds of sickness, to organize a calendar for the historical and chronological preservation of that, their dates, and also a written language in which they could preserve records. Furthermore, he taught them uh, to build the laws by laws of architecture, and in several cases he is accredited with having given them music. He is certainly associated with basic arts and sciences and crafts. And before the complete completion of his mysterious sojourn with them, he had given them the momentum, the impetus, uh, to achieve to a new level of social greatness. Now in several instances we observe thinly veiled what may be the realistic answer to the problem. Namely that this same, same man taught them to gather various plants, taught them to mine the earth, uh, taught them to catch birds for beautiful plumage, and also to raise special fruits and harvests, leading to their prosperity. This implies that this visitor was setting up a proper situation for an exchange of goods. In other words, he was helping these people to develop skills, presumably with the idea that after they had produced this goods, he would take it and merchandise it for them. Furthermore, there is evidence that this stranger left artifacts behind him. He left things that had belonged to his people. These became sacred relics regarded with the most profound veneration. Now, as we begin to analyze this stranger who came from the sea, we almost inevitably come to the conclusion that he could not have been one but many. And this is again sustained by the records. For the records in Chaldea alone seem to point to at least five persons concealed under the identity of Dagon, or Oannes, the fishman. These persons visited the area at widely different periods, but had similar missions and identical contributions to make. And gradually, in prehistory, these personalities were either considered as one person, with a phenomenal length of life, or as re-embodiments or returns of this one person, on a religious level as avatars or re-embodiments. So we look this over with a rather critical thought in mind. We seem to observe a great deal of solid common sense. We have someone coming at that time to a people, establishing perhaps, as in the case in Mexico, where it is said Quetzalcoatl brought with him a retinue of persons of his own kind and established a kind of court or community. In some instances the emphasis is upon religious matters, but always it is upon advancement. And in every instance the same second act takes place. The strangers departed in due course, usually having appointed a successor or someone from among the people to carry on the program that had been started. In each case, the strangers promised to return. 
and in no case did they return. This is, I think, also important. Always the stranger said he would come back. Always he warned the people to keep the rules and laws because he would come back and find out whether they had or not. Also this stranger emphasized the need for honesty and for integrity and for dedication. And he warned the people not to abuse the knowledge which he had given them, stating that if they did abuse this knowledge they would destroy themselves. So with fond adieus of one kind or another, this mythological ancestor, this psychological forebear, vanished back into the sea again. He always went about for the same mysterious road of water by which he had come. His ship or his dragon seemed to vanish under the ocean, and he was never seen again. And his people waited for him, and they kept his rules, sometimes for centuries and thousands of years. And many, even in the world today, whether we realize it or not, are still keeping those ancient rules and still waiting for the return of the hero who came out of the sea. Where you find this may be in 40 or 50 scattered culture groups, it has to have a meaning. There has to be something under it. We can say psychologically that perhaps it originates within man. This can be advanced and sustained with some logic. But it does not explain the lack of certain growth factors. These primitive people say and demonstrate by their later action. Yesterday we were savages. Then this man came, and immediately we were no longer savages. Within fifty years, within twenty years, within a hundred years at most, these primitive peoples began to record their history. They changed their grass huts into great buildings. Sciences, arts, and crafts burst into bloom. Here they are, yesterday they were not. And they tell us that the reason why this change was so rapid was because this knowledge was given to them. It was not evolved the slow and difficult way requiring thousands of years of gradual cultivation. This was given to them as a kind of birthright, a heritage. And they took it upon themselves, and in a very short time gained astonishing proficiency. <coughs> Consider the modern situation. As a result of the entrance of higher culture groups into primitive areas, many backward areas of our earth have been completely transformed in 150 years. We know this is happening, and we know that within the next 50 years many new states and nations that 200 years ago were savages, will sit as civilized human beings at the tables of our conferences. Thus rapidly does this contact bring with it the change in the state of things. This may also explain why, under the tremendous impulse of this almost divine mystery, for with ancient peoples everything that cannot be understood is sacred, under the impulse of this hero and the legends rising around him, small groups of persons became the custodians of the deeper phases of his laws, the knowledge that he could not or would not wish to have forgotten was communicated to the old ones, the priests. They apparently were among his earliest converts the local native wise men. He formed them into schools, into a kind of group of elders, perhaps his form of a privy council or of a legislative body 
to surround him and protect him and advance his projects. When he was gone, these legislators he had trained became the keepers of his wisdom. They are the ones that then proceeded to initiate young people into this body as time went on so that the secrets could not be lost. In some cases the secrets were lost. Some cultures became totally extinct and we have no remnant or record of them as surviving. In the stronger and more healthy groups, however, there was survival. And this survival means that in a reasonably short length of time, these peoples emerged almost simultaneously or very closely uh, allied in time sequences. And that suddenly the curtain of history rolls up and we see history. And we see it coming into our understanding. But behind this history is nothing but secrets. Ancient institutions dedicated to the gods, to the sciences, to the arts, and to the religions. Each of these gods part of a strange order of beings. Now let us remind ourselves of one other thing, that even in the times of Plato and Thales and the other great Greek thinkers, there was a hypothesis strongly held that the gods had originally been mortals. Also, among the Egyptians, Plutarch tells us that the great gods of Egypt were antediluvian kings who had been deified after death. Now this has more or less disappeared from our thinking, but perhaps it also has a bearing upon this present consideration. We do not mean to imply uh, that all religion rises merely from prehistoric history. We do mean to imply, however, that between man as a worshipping being, worshipping the great creative principles of life, and man in his present complicated theological structure, there is an interval of interpretation, of impersonation, of personification by means of which hierarchies or pantheons of divinities have arisen in nearly all parts of the world. These divinities, in most instances, like the Olympian gods, the aces of Scandinavia or the great Egyptian gods of Philae and Luxor, these deities have their stories. They have their histories. They have legends about them. They have their persecutions and their problems, their fortunes and their misfortunes. Uh, they were sometimes victorious and sometimes defeated. And they were subject to most of the moods that mortals can understand. The Egyptians and Greeks believed that these secondary orders of deities might very well have been originally human beings living at a remote time and with unique achievements by means of which they became the patrons and were recognized as divine by lesser peoples to whom they brought culture and enlightenment. This would again fit into our hypothesis. If, for example, there was a cultured people, a highly civilized,